Thank you, Wolfgang. Hello, I'm Martin, and I'm very happy to introduce Nordin Para to you tonight. And please give him a warm welcome. Too. Um, Nuruddin Farah currently lives in Cape Town in uh, South Africa, but he comes from Somalia. He was born in Badoya in 1945, and uh, has, um, uh, as a, even as a child, already uh, spoken and learned uh, five languages and chosen English as the language to write in. Basically, when he told us today, he said, well, that, that was the kind of typewriter he could get. That was an English <laughs> typewriter. So it made a lot of sense to write in English. Actually, Somali is a language uh, that uh, has only been transferred into a written language in 1972 under the regime of Siad Barif. So he is really one of the first uh, Somalian authors with, with written texts. Although Somalia has a very long oral literary tradition, and uh, that tradition is alive in his own family, his mother was a poet, and so there's a certain aspect uh, of literature in, in his own family. Now, um, Nuruddin Farah has studied in uh, Somalia, in India, in England, studied uh, literature, philosophy, and theater, and he's both a playwright and author of essays and stories and a very prolific author of novels. And he has a strange obsession with trilogies. He always comes up with trilogies. And so he started out with a trilogy. Uh, and uh, his work is published in, in uh, about 20 languages. So that I learned uh, first uh, on one hand, because I translated actually one of his uh, novels from English into German, but uh, I also read his novels in German and they're very well translated. The first trilogy, and this is kind of a, a title that you can sort of use for a lot of his work, is called Variations on the Theme of an African Dictatorship. That's the title of the first trilogy and it consists of three novels called Sweet and Sour Milk, Sardines, and Close Sesame. Then there's another trilogy which uh, deals with the pre-collapse situation before the Somalian civil war, consists of the novels Maps, Gifts, and Secrets. And then there's a, the most recent trilogy that it's called, and the English titles are Links and Knots, and that it's really concerned with uh, the civil war that is has happened uh, ever since uh, Siad Barre was uh, chased out of the country. And of course, I mean, if you follow the news, uh, something of this devastating situation is happening right now with the current famine in Somalia and in that part of Africa. Um, fortunately, I was wondering, because uh, I only knew two volumes of the recent trilogy, so I was wondering, well, will there be a third one? And here it is, and uh, he actually brought one of the first copies when he came here. It, he just picked it up at his home. And this is actually a premiere tonight, because this is really the first public reading in front of an audience at all from this <coughs> novel. So for Nuruddin Farah himself, that's quite a premiere, because he, he never has never done that. And he said that this is kind of new for him. He doesn't really know his own novel. That's a normal situation for a writer. Once you've handed it over, you forget about it to a certain extent. You have to rediscover it. But one of the things is he's one of those really important sort of writers of a contemporary global literature who, who set their, their literature always in a specific space and time. And in, in his case, it's Somalia that he's kind of obsessed with, although he was forced into exile and has, has not lived in Somalia consistently for decades. Um, but uh, that's sort of his topic, that's his theme. But uh, the fascinating thing is that you will find a lot of elements in his writing that although they may be specifically related to Somalia, and especially to a society falling apart, you can read that as a metaphor too. There's a lot about family relationships, uh, about characters, about gender issues, about uh, relationships between male and female, about male worldviews, female worldviews, and he's very famous for his female characters too. And so you, on one hand, it's specific, it's located, even in a very 
small area, so to say. On the other hand, it's kind of universal. And so he's like a writer like Salman Rushdie or Garcia Marquez or people like that uh, that create something like a global world literature at the moment. So again, um, and he's won, he's won a number of very prestigious international literary awards. One of the more recent one was the Premio Napoli in Italy. So again, I'm, I'm just very happy and sort of, I think it's, it's, it's 15 or more years back that I translated this first novel and ever since I've been reading his work and we once met on a reading tour in Germany, but this is actually the second time to meet and I'm quite happy to have him here in class and we had a great time in class already. So again, I'm very happy to have you here and this is, again, this is a premiere. So good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Good, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I picked up the book on my way to the airport. I have not, although I seem to be the one who, whose name is printed on the jacket, I haven't seen this book, I haven't read it aloud, uh, and therefore, uh, if I stammer, stumble, you will bear it with me. I'm going to read sections that stand on their own. This is uh, the third part of the trilogy. It's called Crossbones. And I think you know what Crossbones suggests. Don't you? <laughs> uh, we usually talk these days about Somalia and the moment you mention Somalia you hear of pirates and the word crossbones is just the, the head and the skull. So among other things this is a novel about, this is a novel that's supposed to answer some of the questions that you may have raised about the question of piracy. Are they real pirates? Do they exist? Who are they? And so on and so forth. But it's not, uh, hopefully, I, I don't, I wish to say that my novels are not only about one thing, they're about many things. And since there are complications occurring in Somalia, and since this is the third part of the trilogy, all that has to be to be involved. Now there is also another group of Somalis called Ashabab, described often as terrorists, described often by America as allied to Al Qaeda. So what I'm going to do this, today, this evening, is to read a section which concerns itself with a young draftee whose name in Somali is Wahya Hawyar but the name is translated into English and it's Young Thing. Young Thing, in fact, appeared as a story in the New Yorker just before the end of the year, this year. No, this year, just, no, uh, yeah, anyway, you know what I mean. <laughs> a Yankees cap and Ray-Ban wearing boy of indeterminate age, gets out of a car that has just stopped. He climbs out gingerly, one foot at a time, like a spider creeping up a crevice. Then he retrieves a carryall from the trunk of the car without help from the two men sitting in the front. The men are old army hands, and although they haven't said anything to him, he knows that they do not think highly of his lot. He slings the carry all over his shoulder, nodding his thanks to the two men in the vehicle. They look away with obvious disdain. They do not wish to acknowledge his gratitude. He smiles with youthful bravado, betraying non 
of his trepidation. He does not want to fail. He cannot afford to fail. He is aware of the huge difference between martyring oneself and making a blunder of things and getting oneself killed in the process. Of course, he does not wish to die, not unless he has fulfilled his dream. He is small in stature, huge in ambition. On his first day as a draftee into Shabab, the instructor, upset with him, had pulled him up by the scruff of his neck, shouting in Somali, Wahyo yar, you young thing. The sobriquet stuck and he answers to it now. He has had no education to speak of, yet he feels he is rich in heavenly vision. The car reverses and he moves forward on the dirt road, his breathing heavy under the load he carries. It's hot and just before noon he meets a woman in a body tent going in the opposite direction. The woman takes an interest in him, a small boned, four and a half foot tall figure a dwarf, she thinks at first, hoisting a carryall bigger and heavier than he is. She watches him in silence as he puts the carryall down on the ground and sighs with relief. She waits for him to remove his ray bands and reveal his hard eyes before she will consider peeling off her face veil or entertaining any questions from him. My name is Ambara, she says. What's yours? They call me Young Thing, he says. Then with a slight stutter, he asks her to tell him the way to the Qibla. She takes her time. He must be mistaken the Qibla, the Arabic term for the direction in which a praying Muslim faces from north, she thinks. She wonders if he is a grown man with the voice of a boy or a boy in the body of a man. They stand on the dirt road in East Wardigle, a rundown district of Mogadishu, sizing each other up. Ambara is on her way to the Bakaraha market. She needs a few last items for the apartment she is preparing for her guests, Jeble and his journalist son-in-law, Malik, arriving on the morrow. Now she lights upon a thought, studying the young thing, that maybe he is passing himself off as someone he is not, just as he puts on the body tent before she leaves the house as part of her disguise, like a theater prop. Somali women, who never used to wear veils, resorted to them when the civil war began in 1991. They felt safer from sexual harassment by armed youths. But lately, ever since the Union of Islamic Courts took control of Mogadishu, expanding their rule of Sharia law, veiling has become de rigueur. Women are punished if they do not, if they appear in trousers or the less restrictive dresses that were common in Somalia before the Civil War. His hair is the color of ash and is cursed with kinks that no comb can smooth out. From the little that she has heard so far, his voice has not yet broken, yet his face crawls with the deep furrows she associates with the hardened features of a herdsman from the central region where all of Somalia's recent political instabilities have originated. <coughs> Shabab the military wing of the Union of Islamic Courts has been trying to terrorize the residents of Mogadishu into submission and it appears that they have succeeded to a degree, she thinks. Then Ambara points south 
sending him in the wrong direction deliberately, well away from the northeastern part of the city where she lives. Young Thing lifts his carryall and walks in the direction of the woman, in the direction the woman has shown him. He shifts the position of his load from one shoulder to the other. He walks and walks, he loses his balance, just as he recalls picking up the carryall earlier that day. He had been sent to see a heavily bearded man known by the name de guerre, Gerwene, Big Bird. Big Bird manages one of the largest computer shops in the biggest market in Mogadishu, the epicenter of the resistance against Ethiopian occupation. In the carryall, Big Bird has put road, roadside mines, grenades, and other explosive devices, small arms meant to make holes in airplane fuselages in the event of an Ethiopian raid. In truth, Big Bird shared little intelligence with Young Thing, and Young Thing knows that it's not his place to ask questions. He is the advanced member of a commando unit preparing the ground so that Shabab can respond immediately to an Ethiopian invasion of Mogadishu. He is an explosives trainee, but his job today is to consecrate a safe house. Keep it so that the men from the resistance can occupy it and use it. The contingent to which he belongs is composed of a select coterie of fighters sharing a central command which consists of two men. One of them has the nickname Foot Soldier. Feared by those who know him, the soft-spoken Foot Soldier was a colonel in the National Army until 1991. The second man in the command structure bears the nom de guerre al-haq, meaning the truth, a term with divine attributes, as it is one of Allah's 99 names. A modest man, al-haq, gives a more temporal meaning to his name and prefers to be addressed as truth teller. Young Thing knows the protocol. Big Bird will have sent a text message to both Foot Soldier and Truth Teller confirming that Young Thing has picked up the carryall. Special events require special rituals, which are repeated many times over. Each time an insurgent receives a cache of arms or a wadat of cash from the men leading the, the insurrection. Exhausted from lugging, lugging the carryall, Young Thing takes a long break. And then he remembers the uh, agreed upon code. In the rehearsed voice of an actor, he meets a man whom he meets. He meets one of the men whom he meets. Will one of you please tell me which way is north? Because I seem to have lost my way, he says. Then the two men do not exactly, however, the two men do not exactly match the description given to him by his instructors. The older man is slim, very dark and handsome, with intelligent eyes. He is in a sarong. His younger, stockier companion is in Bedouin livery. One of them says to the other, this young thing wants to know the way north. Then the older man replies, what makes you think that he wants to know which way north is? When what he wants to know is the direction of the Qibla. 
young thing can no longer remember which stranger or on what street corner he was supposed to ask for directions. Then young man says, please will one of you tell me which way north is? And one of them again misleads him and tells him that the house that you are looking for is a house with, um, with a green gate bearing the freshly painted inscription Allahu Akbar in red paint. And how far is this house with the inscription, he asks. The old man replies, it's 150 paces to the four-way road. Then you turn right and right again. That is the way north towards the Qibla, toward Mecca, the correct way. You can't miss the green gate or the inscription in blood red. That's the house you want. Young thing is barely out of earshot when the liveried man bursts into derisory laughter, amused at the thought that they have sent the young thing to the wrong property, which belongs to a business adversary of the older man's. The homeowner is out of the country at the moment and has been renting it to a family with a questionable political history because the man belongs to a rival clan of his. He says, two birds with one stone. As the young thing searches for the house with the green gate and the inscription, he blames the frailty of his memory on the fact that he has eaten no breakfast and that a young thing like him can't comprehend the intricate political games adults play. He suspects he is being used by everybody, being misled. Everything is a muddle. All at once, though, he finds the front gate, the, sorry, the front gate with the inscription and he forgets his doubts. He walks past it and then takes a left turn. He wants the back gate as per the di directive. He finds a high fence and he scales it. Because of time, I'm going to jump a little. He enters the property by the kitchen window, squeezing himself through. Thank God he's small, he says, and as agile as a cat on the prowl. Of course, no instructions can prepare one for every contingency. He then remembers his minder asking him to describe the house, to telephone and then to describe the house he has consecrated. In fact, he discovers that his minder asks him several times to repeat how he got to that house. At first, the young thing puts this down to a telephone connection, then he begins to doubt whether he has gone to the right house. He bothers less about it, goes into the kitchen, the refrigerator is buzzing with life, he opens it and seeing plastic containers full of last night's leftovers, he feels hungry and angry too. On the one hand, he hasn't had his fill of meat for a long time and he is tempted to eat the food because he is very hungry. Then he hears movements coming from the front porch. He turns and then he sees through the open door an ancient man, unshaven and in a dressing gown and flip-flops, tottering in the direction of the house. The old man seems equally surprised to see him. But the old man mistakes young thing for one of his many grandchildren. And he says to him, why, you're back early. You see, the wind pushed the door, locked. And when I couldn't get in, 
I fell asleep on the bench under the tree in the front garden. And then he looks at the young thing and realizes he is not his grandchild. The old man is called Dorre, a septuagenarian. Dorre, wearing a dressing gown and under it a pair of pajamas and slippers, shifts in the discomfort of his sleep. He goes back remembering how it all came about. Shifts in the discomfort of his sleep on a garden bench. Then he awakens in a startle in bad need of a shave. It takes him a while to remember that he came out to the porch to take a closer admiring look at a most gorgeous beard with an immense beak and a mixture of colorful plumes. Then a gust of wind shut the door and he couldn't get back in. The bird gone, he walked around the unkempt garden where the trees, their barks peeled, I'm sorry, like peeled off skin, and the shrubs are emaciated from neglect. He feared he might come up against city riffraff camping there, or someone fleeing the fighting, which has lately been ferocious. Property, after all, does not mean what it used to be, he tells himself. He knows what he is talking about. He lived in this city and owned several houses, some for rent. He was once an important man in Mogadishu. Today, he is a man without property, living in a house that is his son's. With no book to read and no one to talk to, he fell asleep on the garden bench. Now his bones are sore and the sciatica in his legs is extreme. He remembers he was having a sweet dream in which he and a childhood friend of his were watching one of his favorite Italian movies, Vittorio De Secca's Shoeshine. He recalls the mesmerizing beauty of cam the camera work as it captured the two boys riding a horse through Rome. Two boys living in innocence until tragedy strikes. There is no innocence in this city, he tells himself. After all, every resident of this city is guilty, even if no one admits to being a culprit. He gets up to full height, yawns leisurely, stretching first his arms, then his legs, until he feels he has overdone the stretching. For a man his age, he is blessed with a sharp mind, but his body is bent as a young branch of a eucalyptus tree. He feels the belt of his dressing gown loosening. In an instant, he'll be almost naked. Not that it matters, he presumes he's alone, and his son, his daughter-in-law, his brood of grandchildren and the maid are all out. It will amuse them to find him in the garden, unshaven, in his pajamas and his dressing gown. Suddenly his heart beat faster. He hears sounds from inside the house and realizes this can only mean danger. He debates what he should do. He's on the verge of walking around the house to find out if there is a way of entering through a back window when the front door opens. Out comes a young thing bearing a gun bigger than himself. The old man and the boy with the gun size each other up. Orre, that's the old man's name, thinks, what if this boy, this young thing, reacts as if he is holding a toy gun? What if he tells himself, even though this may not be the case, that the young thing does not know how to shoot and can't pose much of a threat? So he asks, what have you been doing inside the house? He speaks the way one might speak to a mischievous grandchild. 
The boy says, what are you doing outside? Looking at the two of them and listening to them, you would not be able to tell who is the guest and who the host. The boy standing guard at the entrance to the house, or the old man befuddled and amused. Befuddled because he can't figure out what to do. Amused because he can't imagine such a young thing frightening him. However, there is uncertainty in the old man's demeanor when the boy says, answer my question. Rory tells himself that the boy is putting on a brave face because he has a gun and this endows him with the hollow bravado of a coward. Is the boy the type who will beg for mercy when things are, when things turn nasty? Hardness enters the boy's voice. Answer before I lose my patience. Old man, what are you doing outside in near rags in the garden? Dore replies, the wind locked me out, pushing the door shut behind me when I came out to enjoy a bit of fresh air outside in the garden and I couldn't get back in. So I napped on the bench. There. He points at the bench, his voice laced with a genuine tremor. The boy is thinking, what if he is wrong about the old man? whom he first imagined to be a drifter, with nothing more than the rags he has been lent by a kinsman, a typical tramp come off the streets without his begging bowl, maneuvering his way in. The wind, huh? That's right, the wind. The boy is not convinced. And your clothes? Where are your clothes? Inside. Young thing considers his next move, and the implications, if it does turn out, that the old man lives in the house. He stares at the man with wondering how he can make him disappear before the advanced team arrives. He could act like a trained insurgent, shoot first and explain later that he found the worthless hobo in the garden, insisting that he lived here. But the option of shooting the old man does not appeal to the young boy. Yet, how will he explain himself to the leader of the cell when he shows up? The old man is saying, my name is Dorre, and his outstretched hand waits, ready to shake the boy's hand. When the boy doesn't react, Dorre says, at least tell me your name. Then he takes one speedy step closer to the boy and another step closer to the door. The muscle of the boy's neck stiffen. His jaw goes taut. His whole attitude becomes more threatening. He raises the gas-operated AK-47 and presses the selector switch that turns it fully automatic. The action gives him the composure of a boxer who has just won a knockout in the second round. I wouldn't act the fool if I were you, says the boy to the old man. It is at your peril that you take me for a lame brain. You make one foolish move, you're dead. Fresh worries congregate in Dora's head where they huddle together like a clutch of poorly clad men suddenly exposed to unseasonable frost. This is the closest Dorre has been to danger in his 70 plus years. His hand runs over his head, smoothing what hair there is, a head as bereft of hair as it is of new ideas. How can he bring his peace making pleas to bear on a young mind that has known nothing but violence? and war. He moves nearer to the boy, no longer afraid. Go ahead, he says. See if I care. Shoot me. I won't shoot unless I have to, says the boy. They embark on a badly choreographed lurching dance. 
What's the matter, challenges the problem. One wrong move and you're dead. In their gyration for more favorable positions, Dorre now has his back to the door. All he has to do is to move a step back and he'll be inside the house, the boy outside. But to what end? Why are you here armed? He asks the boy. I am not authorized to tell you, he says. The word authorized coming out of such a small thing gives Lorre a jolt. Perhaps this is one of the boys he's heard about. The new order of youths for higher causes who, even though they receive their instruction from earthlings, ascribe their actions to divine inspiration. He has heard about boys such as this, whom Shabab has kidnapped from other families and then trained as suicide bombers. Boys and a few girls who themselves, who see themselves as martyrs beholden to high ideals. But what can this boy want? Borre says to the boy, I am not an enemy to your cause. Their eyes meet the boy's glance, anxious in its desire to make sense of the old man's sudden friendliness. Borre's gaze takes on a more incisive shrewdness. His bearing grows more sanguine. He adds, tell me what you want done and I'll do it. Just relax, says the boy. That's all. Gloria says, how can I relax when you haven't told me why you are here in our house with a gun, threatening to shoot me, an old man of the same age as your grandfather, if you have one. You say, our house? How many of you live here? My son, his family and I. The exchange is interrupted by young thing's cell phone, which rings. He's aghast. Perhaps the advanced team from the command center is already at the gate, waiting to be let in. His voice breaking, he says, yes, Sheikh, several times, bowing in deference to his absent commander. Lorre consents an abrupt change in the boy's body language, as though he has just realized he's made a major gaffe, <coughs> maybe disobey the command. From the little he can gather, the boy is being told off by the man he addresses as Sheikh. When the call finally ends, the boy seems more agitated than before and barks orders to Dorre, follow me into the house. When they are past the threshold, the boy says, go into the bathroom and bolt the door from inside. Be quick about it and make no sound. What's happening? Asked Dorre. I'll do all I can do to spare your life, the boy says. When Dorre goes into the bathroom, the boy bolts the door from outside too and then goes to welcome the men at the gate. Shall I continue and tell you what happens to the boy and the man? Yes. You want that? Yes. You sure? Yes. You sure? Yes. Big beard, foot soldier, and truth teller. These are the three commandos, the, the chiefs. Approach the house from different vantage points at the same time. Big Beard wraps his purple kefir. You can only tell them by the kefir, the, the color of the kefir. The, you know what kefir is? This. You know Yasser Arafat? You remember Yasser Arafat? His photograph? The one you used to wear? That's it. His was red. His was what? His was red. Good, but you know, there's one who wears red. So that becomes Yasser Arafat? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, <laughs> let's, not, let's not speak ill of the dead. <laughs> Big Beard, foot soldier and truth teller approach the house from different vantage points at the same time. Big Beard wraps his 
purple kefir around his waist, tucks in a revolver just in case, and scales the back wall. Foot soldier, a black kefir around his neck, accesses the compound from a neighboring garden. At the wheel of a pickup truck parked to the left of the front gate, truth teller wearing a red kefir waits until the other man confirms that they are both in the house and it's safe for him to join them. He starts the pickup and waits for one of his mates to open the gate. Then he maneuvers in the truck with caution, pulling a wheeled vehicle on which guns and other weapons are mounted, hidden under a tarpaulin. The front gate securely fastened, the men assemble in the house to set up their operation center. Big Bird calls Young Thing over and without any warning punches him so hard in the face that he collapses in a heap on the floor. Everything is still for a while. The other two men watch as Young Thing pulls himself up, half kneeling his cheek swollen, his lower lip bleeding. When Yang Thing has recovered his balance and stands at attention, Big Bird says to him, do you realize that your negligence had the potential to cause, cause the movement unnecessary loss of life because he'd gone to the wrong house? Truth teller goes on, we wouldn't be here if one of our sympathizers had not by chance informed of our intelligence of your presence in the neighborhood and that you entered this house. Imagine, foot soldier, adds the third one, imagine what would have happened if we had not been alerted to your grievous error. Big Bird, still angry, says, go off. Off with you, go. Then Truth Teller instructs him to stand guard at the gate while they have the initial meeting. With the young thing gone, Big Bird assigns Foot Soldier the task of liaison duty to link the cell they are now forming to the principal cell in the district where the presidential villa is situated. He charged Truth Teller with the responsibility of bringing in the gun parts. With foot soldier on the phone to the command center, Big Bird starts to assemble the weapons. We can skip some of this um, until we come to when all this comes to. And then one of them, one of them, one of the men, and I think it's what color of kefir does he have, this one? Uh, red kefir. The one wearing the red kefir needs the bathroom. So he comes to the bathroom, and he sees the bathroom bolted from the outside. I'm jumping so that, so that you can move. And then he unbolts from the outside. And then he tries to, you know, push it in, but he can't. And he very badly needs to pee. So at this point, he's standing somewhere, and he is, you know, as when people want to pee and they can't pee, they walk like this. And so he's walking around like this. At least I do. <laughs> Big bird addresses a question to the wearer of the red kefir, truth teller, a man with a big nose. He teasily is quiet. What is bothering foot soldier? Why is he pacing back and forth, rubbing his thighs together, his whole body tense? Truth teller replies, he badly needs a bathroom. Can't you see him trying to open the door? Big Bird asks, has Yang Thing come back without our permission? Because he thinks Yang Thing is inside, locked himself in the bathroom. Foot Soldier assures 
big bird that the young thing is outside. In fact, I can see him standing by the gate and saying his rosary as a good Muslim must. Big bird now looks troubled. Why won't the bathroom door open if we are the only people in the house? Stella goes up to check if there is a key in the door on the outside. He pushes the door, kicks at it, and then puts his shoulder to it and shoves. But the door does not give. He says to Big Bear, it's locked from the inside, I think. Foot soldier asks, who is inside then? Big Bird is growing impatient. He slaps Foot Soldier, shouting, What kind of a man are you that you can't hold your pee? He turns to Truesteller and orders him to call Young Thing in. Truesteller knocks into the furniture as he goes, <coughs> kicking at chairs. Is someone in the bathroom? He asks the Young Thing. Dore does not know what to do. Dore is the old man. He checks his face in the mirror. Even a dying man wants to look comparatively clean, he tells himself. He realizes with concern that it will be the end of the boy. One moment, he has a good mind to open the door and be done with it. The next moment, he feels inadequate to the task. He's dizzy, gulping air into his lungs, fearing that he will faint before he can open the door. Then he hears the boy say, Old man, open the door. He unlocks the door and steps out. Foot soldier can't wait any longer and hurriedly pushes past him into the bathroom. Meanwhile, Tristella and Young Thing step out of Borre's way and keep their distance. Big Bird asks Borre to come closer to him. His eyes penetrate deep into Dore's fear. Being a film buff, the old man thinks of Psycho, sensing that Big Bird has something of the actor about him. Big Bird asks, Why are you here, old man? Because I live here, replies Dore. Foot soldier comes out in time to hear this. The eyes of all three kafir wearing men converge on young thing. Truth teller asks the boy if this is true. Young thing says he's a hobo squatting here. Foot soldier is angry because he had to wait until he almost wet his robes. Smacks Dorre, the old man in the face. Tell us the truth. I'm telling the truth, he says. Truth teller, for his part, hits young thing, the strike splitting the boy's lower lip and making it bleed again. He asks, is he a hobo squatting here or does he live here? When the boy touches his lip as if to wipe it dry, truth teller hits him two more times. Big Bird tells Truth teller to stop pummeling the boy in front of a stranger. He adds, can't you see? I'm talking to the old man. Dorre says, I'm a guest, not a drifter. So who lives here? My son, whom I visit. What's your son's name? Dorre now realizes that he has inadvertently brought his son into focus. All that remains for him is to say his son's name and somebody will get killed because Shabab does not like his son. The beard's expression is fluid, like dirty water going down a gutter, habitually moving in a downward direction. Even though he's not sure it will do the young man any good. The old man hopes that his statement, the one that he's going to make, will help the young thing. Let me say for what it is worth, he says, that this young fellow meant no ill to you or your cause. I would appeal to you to Spain. Islam is peace. 
the promise of justice because I may have misled the young boy. Please pardon him. Borre descends movement behind him and from a corner of his eye he spots truth teller with his weapon poised but not yet ready to shoot. He pushes Borre, the old man, down with the butt of the firearm. Sitting on a chair, the old man feels the harsh metallic coldness of the weapon against his nape. Foot soldier says to a young thing, you've proven delinquent in your behavior. By lying, do you realize you've risked your life and the lives of your fellow fighters? Why? Young thing says, I won't do it again. Big Bird orders Young Thing to get his gun from the carryall and to return. As he waits for instructions, Young Thing does not plead with any of the men to spare his life or that of the old man. Big Bird then says to Young Thing, shoot him. The old man at him. Dora says, please. Young Thing can't determine if the old man is pleading with him not to shoot or if he is saying, go ahead and shoot, please. He looks toward Big Beard, who is busy fingering his long bushy beard, twisting it with the concentration of a philosopher deep in thought. Or he thinks, that it is in such a scene where violence gains the upper hand that one can bear testimony to tragedy in all its registers. A country held to ransom, a people subjected to daily humiliation, a nation sadly put to the sword. Foot soldier says, what are you waiting for? Time passes as slow as death. True Stella shouts, shoot! Young Thing might as well pull the trigger and be done with it, he thinks, without a flinch or immediate regret. <clears throat> Although he is aware, despite his young age, that his action will recoch it about in his brain and keep him awake at night, disturbed and jittery. He knows too that he is only postponing his own death. No sooner will he shoot the old man than one of the kafirs will make him pay for the crime of not wasting Borre right away. He wishes he had listened to his older sister who had told him do not join the Shabbat. Young Thing shoots the old man using the silencer. As the bullet strikes the old man in the forehead, Young Thing is certain that he hears a seabird cawing. Only he cannot interpret what it is saying or whether it's foretelling his own imminent death. Borre falls off his chair, dropping to the floor in an uncoordinated heap of self-reproach. He is sad that he has no time to alert his son, his daughter-in-law and his grandchildren to the ambush that awaits them. His silence preserves the memory of his last words with them as one treasures a memento mori. From his posture alone, you can't tell if the old man is dead. He lies on his back, head to one side, eyes not wholly closed, his position suggesting sleep. The kafir wearing men sit in the eerie silence that follows the shooting. Each an island of disturbed tranquility. The ringing of a cell phone startles them out of their immobility. They exchange bothered looks. Young Thing glances around as if trying to calculate not if but how soon one of them will shoot him. The realization that he might die in a matter of minutes concentrates his mind and he resolves not to be afraid. He walks over to where the old man had lies sprawled, his legs splayed, his neck crooked. 
his hands spread out by his side, his nakedness embarrassing. As a token of his fearlessness, young thing straightens the old man's legs and places his hands together across his chest in the gesture of a man praying. He moves back a pace and looks at what he has done. Pleased that he has made the old man as comfortable in death as he can be. Then he waits for his own death. Big Bird has anger etched into his features. Impatient, he is looking from foot shoulder to truth teller, as though wondering why they have not yet acted on his rage. Then even more furious, he watches young thing as if he were expecting the boy to fall to his knees in terror. He says to young thing, have you anything to say before you die? Young thing is defiantly silent. He glances from Big Bird to Foot Soldier and then focuses his unrelenting stare on Truth Teller. Big Bird says to Truth Teller, will you do us the favor of ridding us of this thing, this vermin? Foot Soldier says, I was hoping you would ask me. Big Bird says, fear not, you'll have your turn. But this is Truth Teller's turn. I have never seen him kill a thing before. Truth Teller closes his eyes, winces like a child taking bitter medicine, and shoots young thing right between the eyes. Then he unscrews the silencer from his gun. Well done, Big Bird says. Then he orders the foot soldier to remove the two corpses, dump them in the garden, and report for duty in double quick. He adds, there is a lot of work for us to complete before nightfall. Remember, we have a country to liberate, a people to educate in the proper ways of Islam. Come, be quick about it. You too, let's hold on you. Truth teller volunteers to help foot soldier, each of them dragging a corpse from the room before rigor mortis sets in. Thank you very much. I'm prepared to answer questions if you have them, and if you don't have them, we'll just go away. <laughs> Yes, sir. Um, the inspiration for that story, where, where did you get it? Where did you uh, something like it must have happened. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean... Well, that's, that's, that's enough, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, was it uh, someone close to you involved in it, or no, it was just a second-hand account? I don't... Not second. Uh, it can't be first. First, yes. Yeah, well, I mean, if it occurred to me, I uh, should be first. Of course, yes. As I was saying to uh, the class, do you call them class? For the people to whom I spoke earlier. Uh, I do not actually uh, expend much energy on what they call inspiration. I'm a, I'm a writer. Writers write, and I write. And so, where do I get such a story? You hear such a story, you imagine such a story. And if I can imagine it, it must be possible. Yes, sir. Do you research such a story? Uh, how much, how much uh, energy do you put into um, uh, understanding the politics, understanding the culture uh, as, it, as it is in the time period that you're writing? Well, I do a lot of research, but not, not this kind of story. I, I do a lot of research. Uh, if, you, if you see this book, you will see, actually, that there is an acknowledgement. All the books, articles, and things that I have consulted 
uh, in this book. So that if somebody doesn't believe me what I say about the pirates, you just go to some of the articles. Some will obviously agree with me, some will disagree with me. In the same way as, you know, uh, scholar, academic scholar writing a book, you have to prove that what you're actually writing is close to the truth. And that all I do is interpret. Well, that seems to be it. Yes, madam. Do you consider yourself a political writer? No. No, because I don't separate life and politics. It's part and parcel of the same thing. You, uh, let me give you an example. Is marriage political? Would you say marriage is anti-politic? Is what? Or the marriage? Yeah. Yeah. Is it? Uh, no, but I guess some people could say yes. When would they say it is? Why? When? Are there moment specific marriages that are political and other marriages that are not? Sure. Well, I mean, marriage is political in that when two genders or the same genders meet, when the same gender is, you know, a man gets married to a man, which happens in some places, uh, it becomes a political issue, and the reason is because, you know, gay, the gay thing is a political thing. Even marriage between a man and a woman, two families marry each other, really. I mean, although they are two individuals. And therefore, everything that you look at Anything that you do that affects more than one person is a political something. And therefore, the story that I have just told is not political. It's human. It's something that happened. It's the death of someone. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I, I just want to know if you know the, the Islamist movements in the particularly East Africa are are enforcing or rather doing away with a sort of tribalism that we kind of witness in some parts of Africa, which I think is part of the problem alongside many other problems of course. But I'm just wanna know for instance this Al Shabab movement, are they are they trying to kind of Doing forced tribalism by, or rather, in a sort of, a sort of opportunistic tribalism. Yeah. What is tribalism? Like you know, for instance, uh, in the sense that the <coughs> the broadest identity you would identify yourself with basically is your immediate tribe, as opposed to a broader identity such as I don't know. Of course, because I don't think you would expect many people in in the continent to identify themselves as part of a nation state because I think... How would you do that? How, you, how could you say that? Do you know how much you know about that area? No, I mean... Uh, are there no nations? There are, there are only tribes. No, of course not. No, I'm saying... Uh, no, but in, in, in the sense that... Uh, the are you quoting Rudyard Kap Kap Kipling in which, you know, the... the that the African can't think? Is that what you're saying? Basically, oh, what are you saying? No, I think you Why would they not be a nation? No, you know, but what I'm trying to say is that I think all the, all the Africans who are, all the African friends who are really uh, like, in between, like, but those are mostly in West African countries, like Anna, for example. But they are, they are really pessimistic in the sense that uh, and they will, they will all say that uh, tribalism is a problem in Africa alongside, of course, the problem of colonialism. Where do you come from, sir? From Iran. And how long have you lived here? If I may ask. Her? Here? Yeah. I mean, in I mean how, how, how much do you know about Swiss society? I don't think I know that. Where do you know? Where else do you know? 
Give me, give me a country there. Where, where, you know, I'm getting warmed up. Yeah. <laughs> where, where, what countries do you know apart from Iran? Do you know the States, America? No, I don't. Do you know England? Yes. You do, you know England? Yes. All right. Now, uh, do you know Belgium? Have you heard of Belgium? Yeah, I've been there and I'm like... Now, in Belgium there are two tribes, are there? Yeah. Are there? No, but, uh, I mean, no, I mean, <laughs> it's not how, I mean, you, you mean the historical sense or the historical sense? I mean, of course I get what you're trying to say, but then... What am I, go, what am I saying? <laughs> you're trying to say that any identity is ultimately a form of tribe, but then... I did not say that. <laughs> Yeah. But, uh, I, I'm not intending to say it. But I think you're getting it wrong. I mean, I'm not trying to say. I mean, I was, I was exactly striving at the opposite of, I think, what you were thinking of what I was saying. No, identities, identities in political terms. Identities in political terms. Whether you are in America, there is the Italo-American, the German-American, the Swiss-American, the, you know, these hyphenated identities. Now, if you accept these as tribal or tri tribalisms, then I would say, okay, well, in Africa too, we have, we have tribes. In, um, in England, uh, somebody would be a Welshman, another one would be an Irishman, and a third one would be an Englishman. And these are identities that are, generally speaking, cultural and political. The reason why we have problems in Africa has nothing to do with tribalism. It has something to do with the same sort of things that you would also be interested in getting to know about, and that is social justice. Where there is a dictatorship that runs and runs and runs people down, humiliates them, takes their liberty from them, wherever it is, people will rise against them. Now, it is very possible that people through, because of their being inarticulate, because they're not educated, they're not articulate enough, they may use the wrong term to describe well, the problem is. In other words, if you have a person, a villager, even a German Swiss villager, or any villager, who does not know how to diagnose cancer, he might simply say, oh, there is a boil here, because that's an unscientific way of describing cancer. Why? Because he doesn't even know what cancer is. Now, what you are now doing is without you, without thorough knowledge, you have misdefined the problem in Africa. The problem in Africa, as it is the problem in Iran, is a problem of social justice. Well, of course, yeah. I mean, I was... So tribalism is not, does not enter the picture. Islam does not enter the picture. Islam is also, in some parts of the world, being used as a political means to get to power. So any person who uses a ladder to climb to great heights is just using it for his political end. Iran, the same. Why are they just as corrupt, the Ayatollahs, as uh, the Shah of Iran was? because they wanted to get to power and the only access, the only way they could enter through all this was religion. Shabbat is doing exactly the same thing. Yes, but, uh, for instance, one of the positive aspects of these uh, one of the laws was, for instance, what like Iran was saying, like, uh, one of the, I think, for instance, with the, like the, the only good thing about and the Iranian revolution was that it kind of moved a bit further towards the idea of a nation state in a, in a political sense. So 
So, because of course you have both like positive aspects. I mean, I'm I'm trying to look at it like in a direct way, basically. I mean, you have you have a negative side, you have a positive side. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. So, no, but I was I, I'm I'm definitely not trying to suggest that. Uh, no, that I, I identify myself with the African part, absolutely. Thank so you. I, I don't think you are an African or not. That's my point here. Thank this you. is not the point. I mean, I'm, I, if I don't know that, is obviously it's a shame, of course. But then, in another sense, uh, I don't think you are an African. I am not. I mean, uh, I would fully identify myself with the plights of African people. Although in this name, Africa is very problematic. I'm sure you would say that. I don't think it's right to say Africa as as if you know you can, all these countries you can just make them into one one particular name. You have Ghana. You have. Somali, you have Sudan, you have, I don't know, you have so many, you have, you know, Sub-Saharan, you know, it's even also even more absurd because, but for instance in Ghana, I mean, so, uh, I, I know a little bit about Ghana, they say, there, you know, uh, part of the problem is that tribes can, like, people cannot even talk to each other. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, sir. How do you name your character, or, or why? Why do you name your character as such? Well, uh, the names are usually well. It happens very often in it. when I published my first novel at the age of twenty or so. I remember two, three years later. I remember walking in the street in Mauritius, and a woman ran after me and said, you know, uh, the story that you have with, that's my story. And I said, how is it your story? She said, my name is Adla, which is the name of the character. And this happened, and this happened, and this happened, and this things happened in your story. So they're mine. You, know, you should share the royalty with me. <laughs> now that's one reason. And therefore you avoid as best as you can. You can't always do it. The other thing is, what happens very often is, especially if you are writing something like this, man being killed, young man doing this, that sort of thing. You have to find a name with which no one can identify. No one can say, this is mine. Or no one can say, he has written about this. That's why Young Thing, there is no one called Young Thing. No one can come to me and say, my name is Young Thing. So that's, that's one way of... of Oh. The other thing that I do, uh, and it's um, as a matter of, um, of artistic interest, it will interest some of you, is the names of the characters. If you have 26 characters in a book, and if one of them is called Sam, the other one is called Samantha, and someone is reading the book, Every now and again, they will confuse the two names. Why? Because they are too close to each other. You know, we all read fast, at least I do. And therefore, you discover that you've named Sam Samantha, and Samantha becomes Sam. And so, on. so in order to avoid it, every, it's advisable for every name to start with a different letter of the alphabet. So that even if you read very fast, you can't mistake it. Yes, sir. You mentioned that you had your first novel published from you, did you say, in your 20s? Yes, I wrote you when I was 22, yeah. And I would just be interested, because I know even getting a first novel published is always going to be quite difficult. And I was wondering if you had any particular challenges. Well, I had the particular challenges because I had written two novels before my first published novel. <coughs> And I didn't know publishers. I didn't know how they worked. I had never heard of agent, a young thing. <laughs> Growing up in Somalia and I was in India when I wrote my second novel. And my first novel I wrote when I was in India. When I was, sorry, when I was in Somalia. And so when I wrote my third novel, 
and the second novel has been turned down by an American publisher called Knopf. Uh, I, I asked some friends of mine, there was a young woman, English woman, who was a friend of a friend, and she was working for the DSO, you know the DSO, Voluntary Service or Organization or something, like the Peace Corps, the British Peace, Peace Corps. And she was going to London, so she said, oh, American, I hear you finished a novel. I said, yes. She says, uh, would you like me to take it with me and give it to a publisher? I said, that's what you do. She said, yes. I said, why not? She took it. And then she sent it to a publisher. And the publisher wrote a letter to me. Dear Nuruddin Faro, are you a man or a woman? <laughs> And the reason is because the, the, the first novel had a, its main character is a female, Mali mm -hmm. Nomad, who runs away from, you know, and forced marriage and so on and so forth. It was, it, it, he was convinced that I was a woman. And up to now, I receive letters addressed to Mrs. Farrell. <laughs> they see the photograph, you know, sometimes one of the reasons why I keep my mustache. <laughs> <laughs> to make sure that somebody sees it. You see. <laughs> so anyway, um, I had difficulties with my first two novels, neither of which has ever been published, and I have no idea where they are. My third novel, which I wrote when I was 22, and which was published, is now in Penguin Classics. So it must have been something. Must be. Maybe they're always writing to Mrs. Power. Maybe they think it's <laughs> so the challenge was a good one. Yes, sir. Um, sort of based on the introduction, um, um, the discussion about oral histories and oral literature, which I thought was an interesting way to put it, and. Um, the typewriter. Um, it, uh, it made me think of uh, uh, Mark Twain and deciding to do his autobiography as an oral transmission. And um, my question is, just a, I don't know if there's an answer really, but is is do you think that, that having that mechanical tool? in some ways might make it easier to imagine a story as opposed to telling a history, a personal history or even a relative's history or the history of relatives? Well, first of all, you know, different writers write in different ways. Um, I write everything in longhand first. So this book was written in longhand first before I went to the computer. And that used to be the case. I used to write in longhand, and then I would go to the typewriter. What the typewriter does is it makes it readable to other people. Because my handwriting, nobody can read it. I can't even read it. Two days later, I can't read it. I must be in a different mental frame. Uh, you know, two days from, from the day that I write. So I think different authors get their kick from different, <coughs> from different things. I was going to say different uh, drug uh, injections. And the reason is because we're different. And what happened to Mark Twain cannot say to to anyone else. There is a very fascinating novel called For Bread Alone, which was orally told by a Moroccan to his American writer lover. Uh, Paul Bowles, who lived in Tangiers, met a man called Mohammed Chukri, 
and Mohammed Shukri, who is a drifter, some kind of a whore in Tangiers, made a hole. Does that exist? <laughs> it must. <laughs> and he told his story, his experiences, and adventures to four poets who put it down. And it was published as a book, first in English and then translated into many languages. And Paul Bowles doesn't mention write his name. So Mohammed Chukri's name is written on the title cover. And the book is called For Bread Alone, which is a good book, wonderful book. You know, being male prostitute in 10 years, in the 50s. Interesting. So that's the kind of oral thing you were talking about? I, it, I think I was probably thinking about it because of the questions of travel uh, things and also because of the introduction. Um, I'm, I'm Scottish. My, my clan is most clan, like my last name. And so when I was but there... But you're an American, so. That's right, yeah. And so, but I went back and met the mother of my clan chief ah, uh, in, the, in, in Scotland, and yeah. she recognized me across the room right away as <laughs> one of the, the clan. Oh. And, uh, um, and in the research I did from the early travelers to Scotland, it, uh, the, uh, the heritage of the, the oral transmissions um, there prior really just to Catholicism. Uh, going through there, the Romans and so forth, is that they would take young children into uh, the society for this transmission into caves and spend 20 years teaching them these long stories. And any time there was an exchange of any goods or relations like a marriage or something like this, then one of these men would come forth and tell the story of both families uh, at that well, time. Well, it's the same, same sort of uh, stories in Somali. Mm -hmm. As a child, the Somali would be given the 30, 30 ancestors' names, and then you get a new, say, my name is Nuriti, the son of. I can't remember them all now. Mm -hmm. you know, which I to yeah. Yes. How did you end up in Chandigarh? Uh, That's a very, very fascinating story because what happened was I, I was at the age of 18, I was given two scholarships. One was to take me to America, to the University of Wisconsin Madison. And I was to do English literature, or rather American literature, and journalism. And the other one was to go to India, and because I was interested in Indian philosophy. And so when I decided to turn down the offer from the University of uh, Wisconsin Madison, the professor, the American professor, I remember wagging his fingers at me and saying, you stupid little nitwit, because you know you want to become a writer and you will never ever become a writer if you go to me. Now I met that man <coughs> several years later after I published many other books and I said to him, I was, a, you know, I was stupid at the time, but I am wiser now. So that, that is the story. It was a choice I made. Many people would have preferred to go to America. I preferred to go to England. And I enjoyed it. I lived there for four years. Yes, sir. If I understand correctly, then you are mostly writing in English. How you're writing about your idea of your country, or what you perceive as your country, you write about it. Is there eventually a difference between writing about or writing for 
something? Or may I rephrase that? What is the perception or what is the appreciation of your books in the mind? Can you stand? Do you have any knowledge? Well, people say very, very kind things about it. Uh, if you're asking me a question, you would not have put to Samuel Beckett, who wrote in French. You would not say to him, you're an Irishman. What has an Irishman got to do with writing in French? Maybe, maybe the question is then also more about, I mean, going back to the introduction where it was mentioned that um, the Sumerian language was only shortly noted. I mean, yeah, as a, as yeah. A, Somali had no script until 1970. And so I could not have written in Somali. No, no, the, 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 the question is something that comes up quite often. And usually one is asked, if one is an Indian or an African and writing in a European language, one is often asked. But the Europeans, there are many Europeans who also write not in their own mother tongue, but in another language. And no question is asked as such, for example. I mean, no one asked. Uh, Samuel Beckett, you know, Waiting for Godot was written first in French and then he translated it into English. You know the play Waiting for Godot. And therefore, there is a certain uh, preparedness for people to accept that certain. If I wrote in German, I, I would be, you know, you know what they say that if. if If a European speaks good Chinese, he's a Chinese expert. If a Chinaman speaks good English, he's a clever Chinaman who speaks good English. Would it change in any way if we talk about a nation or a state or a structure that has only been emerging as such recently? that is still potentially struggling with its own identity, existence, with its own language. Well, you may have, again, the wrong impression of, uh, say, Somalia is the only country in the continent of Africa where everybody speaks the same language and where people think of themselves as a nation. And in fact, the problem is Somalia has been split up into different states. And they've been trying to form themselves into one nation. And the concept of nation is in everybody's head. No, they know what a nation is, and that's what they, they've been fighting for. Whether or not uh, the state structure. Now, until the 19th century, the idea of the state was a young thing. And it didn't really quite exist. At that same time, there were states in Africa. There were several states in West Africa, the Shanghai Kingdom. In Somalia, there were three, four little states, mini states. They do not function in the same way bureaucratically as the states do because of the written structure. Because Ethiopia, for example, Abyssinia had a state and it had a script. And therefore that is accepted as a state. When you have a state but no written tradition, it becomes very difficult conceptually to be considered as a state. But Somalia formed part of the Ottoman Empire. So once you form part of an empire, and naturally that means you're part of one of the states, because the empire extended all the way down to Somalia, the Ottoman Empire. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, could you talk about um, if 
fear as um, as an instrument of um, the continuation of colonialism. I mean, I haven't read the your know, book, but um, and we were talking in um, the Basel Judith uh, Basel uh, class about fear and. Um, that was in the past uh, uh, session from last year, but could you talk about how fear works in, 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 in reproducing or continuation of colonialism? I just need more. All right, uh, I'm, I'm I need a handle to right. hand hold on. Okay. Uh, I'm not, the reason why I'm asking this is because I'm trying to put it in the context of Puerto Rico and how, and I'm, I don't know exactly the, the history of Somalia. No, talk, if, talk if, about Puerto Rico, I know, I know enough about it. If, if it was a colony also, but um, how politics and fear and uh, uh, you mean instilling fear? In yes, people. instilling fear in the population, in, 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 in the individuals, uh, reproduces. And the nature of fear, what is the nature of that fear? Um, it's, it, goes, it, it goes back to the economical, to the economical, to the sphere of um, fearing uh, taking taking a step and, and, and making uh, a step towards independence and um, acting out or, or not acting out but taking the act of like well if, if uh, uh, let me let me try what uh, what I understand by the question because instead of actually fear, I would have said one of the things that anyone who is in a much better position than yourself, the colonialists were in a much better position militarily, you know, uh, than the colonized. So what I think it would happen would be you would instill a kind of mental domination on the subject so that that subject, the, the Puerto Rican subject, would not have the self-confidence to say to America, America, go away, we can run our own affairs. Th that's precisely what, what I'm trying to do. Yeah, that's I, 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 I want to know if that if there is a similarity or there is a... Well, there is a similarity, wherever, you know, in fact, in not only in the relationship between the colonizer and the colonized, but in the relationship between men and some of the, you know, some men and the wives, you know, they, they instill fear, lack of self-confidence, everything the woman does, sometimes the men would say, oh, come on, you don't know how to do it. A woman is driving, she makes a mistake. We all do make mistakes when we are driving. At least I make 20 mistakes in 35 minutes. Nobody would insult me. Why? Because I'm a man. Whereas a woman, instead of turning left, she makes a mistake, signals right and then turns left, and say, what does she know? She's a woman, of course. So that is the kind of logic that happens. And then until you lose self-confidence, you say, I can't do it. I can't do it. So that is part of, of, of that. And I know some of my Patrican friends in New York who, who say that it's very difficult for their people to get together and work out a common this. Uh, 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 agenda, a comment. And, and my, my, my theory is, is, is that um, fear is what, but, uh, what stops them from doing what they want to do. 
Yeah, they moved there. Yeah, they moved there. Well, but probably fear as well. Maybe that's what, yeah. Maybe I'm wrong with it. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, I have a question. I'm not sure if I can give you a handle to answer it. I'll try my best. You, at some point, you, you talk about, let's say, a political character of marriage, for example. And in another point, you also talk about uh, the problem in Somalia being uh, a social problem or a problem of social equity. I don't know if I got it right. Yes. But it's a, it's a common question, I think, uh, in the air, in the left, in philosophy, in cultural thinking. Uh, a certain uh, disagreement sometimes between uh, the ones that think that all the questions boil down to the question of uh, economic equity and the others that may think that uh, that the problem is distributed in, in questions of gender, of identity, of culture and so on. So I wonder if you could develop a bit on your idea. Of Well, it's a, it a, it a very big question, and we have very small time. And so it poses a greater challenge than you might think to answer it adequately. Let me say that social justice I was saying earlier that uh, the famine in Somalia is not only a result of the weather and brainlessness. It's the fact that there is no democracy in the country. No strong opposition to fight against dictatorship, against corruption, and so on and so forth. Now, you may define many different things to get to this particular point. The point is, when the individual worth of a person is not respected by the political state school or by the economic situation, you have a problem. Sometimes you define it as a political thing, you come through the door of politics. Sometimes as a Marxist Leninist, you come through economics and you say almost everything. And sometimes as a feminist or as a sympathizer of feminism, you come through gender. But every one of these is valid. And it's supposed to deal with one or the other of the problems that you have. The problem in the end is that many persons feel incomplete. Incomplete in the sense they have no job, they have no education, they have no rights, they live in a shack, they have no future. The sum total of this is the person is worth nothing. Does that answer part of the question? Yes, sir. I know you didn't want to talk about um, inspiration as much, but I was wondering if you could say a tiny bit about um, influences, just oh, perhaps um, influences, just perhaps like what types of writing or what writers specifically you gravitated towards at the beginning when you were trying to write your first novels, if there was. Yeah, well, uh, first of all, it's easier when you're beginning writing to focus all your interests on the books that have fascinated you. The ones that when you finish, you, know, you say, I wish I had written this. And the best compliment that a writer can give to another writer is, I wish I had written this book. When I was young, I was, the first fascination was actually Thousand and One Nights. And then, obviously, I 
started reading and I found myself being interested in an author like the American William Faulkner and James Joyce authors who wanted to bring their story individual personal story expressed through narratives that were bigger than the stories they were telling they were writing about if I were influenced by some writers I would say well I could mention Joseph Conrad Virginia Woolf Samuel Beck Joyce these were the authors who I read and reread but I also made sure that nothing that I have written reads like theirs now earlier you mentioned the expression let me tell you something when I am in the middle of some work I could actually take a publicity for pizza and read it and then get a paragraph and a half out of reading you know the one that says Butler's pizza is the best pizza <laughs> you know San Marco's pizza in Rome is the best pizza <laughs> these are the words that you would use what I'm saying to you is that if you if your brain if your mind is working and working continuously on an idea or something you would get inspired by anything that you read and let me also say for example that it's very important that I mention this and that is I like working every day for the same number of hours from 9 until 5 that's work time sometimes I'm not even writing I may be sleeping I may be making coffee I may be you know uh, reading this pizza is the best pizza on earth but I'm not going out and I'm not you know socializing and I'm not doing any of these these are the things that help better than what I consider to be defined as inspiration and let me say this for what it is worth that Have you ever been a farmer? Was I ever a farmer? Yeah. Um, Never a farmer. Now, my, the people I know who are farmers, especially they, they hold you know, dairy farms and such, they tell me that if you go to a cow to milk, one morning at 7 o'clock, the next morning at 9, the third morning at midday, third day at midday, and so on and so forth the cow will not produce any milk because the cow has to know when the milk has to come down to be milked the brain, the human brain is something similar to that if you sit down at the same hours every day your mind would switch off all the other garbage that you, you know, the muzak, you know, in taking the lift, all this noise and so on. And you would be able to concentrate fully on that. So if you're interested in writing, I would suggest you. Yes, madam. Why, um, why is it you feel you're so good at writing the characters of women and what advice would you have to the group about representing women in their work? The first question I, I got, the second part of the question I didn't get. What, uh, what, did advice, I say? what advice would you have for this group about representing women in their work? This group? Yeah. <laughs> Well, first of all, I should say that the principal thing is I believe in the total equality of the human person. 
male, female, they're equal to me. Second, I say that everything I have written is a tribute to my mother, who is a poet. It could be, therefore, that my empathy toward my mother and my sisters, with whom I get along far better than I do with my brother, or with my father, maybe that empathy translated itself into you know, uh, into easy living, continuing, and feel, you have to feel at ease in a situation. If you wear in terrible shoes, you feel uneasy. You can't think properly. You're always thinking about your feet. Yes. When you have problem with your feet, you can't think. You can't write. You can't do anything. The majority of Writers, even I know women writers, they don't feel at ease in the company of these characters who live inside you. You know, they, they live inside you. If you trust them, welcome them, accommodate their wishes, their demands, you, you, you can write very well about them. So maybe that's, that's the answer to the question. What would I say to this particular group to, yeah, I would say, devote more time, be generous, first to yourself and then through yourself to them, to the characters of our people, right? Yes, madam, with a glass in the middle. Yes. Did you also say in the choice what uh, piece of work, what short story or novel, novel that you want to teach to undergraduates who know nothing about you? About? About you. About me? Yes. No. You have to ask. Uh, you have to ask someone else, and the reason is because you know. But you've taught your own work, haven't you? I'm sorry. You've taught your own work, haven't no. you? No, you haven't. No. In fact, it's, uh, I know many writers who teach their own work, but you know, I go to, I was teaching, I teach at universities and my books are on the syllabus. I usually say, no, I'll teach everything else, but not that one. <laughs> and you know what happens very often? The other professors are extremely happy to teach them, but what they do very often is they come to my classes often enough for them to get a drift of where my mind is going. I don't, I don't like uh, teaching my books. Very often I don't even carry books, my books. There were two questions. What was the second? Well, it's more of a comment. I just want to say thank ah. you. It was a pleasure to hear you read. So I just want to say thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, in fact, the, the problem here was I hadn't read it, and because of time, I was cutting all the time, and therefore, it wasn't the, the best reason I've given, I can assure you. Thank you. Thank you.